So we always have to start these with a disclosure slide. This is a slide in which I tell you that I'm not in the pocket of any drug companies, which will pre rapidly become obvious. Um, I also, it, but I think the more important disclosure is I am a general internist and a primary care doctor, and I have no particular expertise on this topic. So if you came here for a detailed discussion of healthcare economics, you probably want to find someone who has more economic expertise than you can get on NPR. So we'll talk in a few minutes about what I actually am going to cover. Um, the other thing that I should definitely say is I do have strong opinions. There will be some ranting. These are my own opinions. They are not the opinions of the state, the University of Washington, UW Medicine, the Department of Medicine, or anyone with a particular interest in testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Bill, Bill's gone. So what I actually came to talk about um, is not so much the oh, how big pharma is manipulating us all and ruining everything, because that's a different talk, and you can get that lots of places. I really wanted to talk a little bit more about what we specifically can do to try to contain prescribing costs. So this is kind of an offshoot of the idea of high-value care, which I'm hopefully, hopefully most of you have heard of, and talking about high-value prescribing. For those of you for whom Grand Rounds is not complete without a picture of an antibody, there will be one at the end, so stay tuned. But otherwise, we're going to be mostly talking about this. So show of hands, how many of you are familiar with Choosing Wisely? That is awesome. So Choosing Wisely is an initiative of the American Board of Internal Medicine, their foundation arm. That's the part you don't have to hate. They don't have anything to do with MOC. They do good things. Um, and they have basically gone to a number of subspecialty societies and said, give us a list of things that maybe people shouldn't be doing. So when I wanted to talk about high value prescribing, I said, this is great. I've got all these lists. All I have to do is look at the list, pull some points out of there. I've got myself a talk, no problem. So I went through the list. American College of Physicians, nothing. Society of General Internal Medicine, highly controversial recommendation against screening physical exams, absolutely nothing about drugs. Society of Hospital Medicine, one recommendation about drugs. Anybody know it? Going once, going twice, Bueller. Don't use PPIs in patients for uh, GI prophylaxis in patients who don't need them. So if they're ward patients, if they're not in the unit, please don't do that. That's their one choosing wisely having to do with drugs. American College of Cardiology, nada. American Thoracic Society, please do not use drugs for secondary pulmonary hypertension uh, without at least thinking about how much they cost and treating the cause of the secondary pulmonary hypertension. Good idea. <laughs> then I scored. American Geriatric Society, seven of ten recommendations involving pharmaceuticals. So I could stand here and I could run those down for you and we could be done. But the problem is they basically all come down to this. Drugs are toxic for old people and we should use less of them and we should use them less often. All right, we're done there. <laughs> so let's drop back a little bit and talk a little bit about value since we're going to talk about high-value prescribing. You know, value, if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, it is worth or quality as measured by a standard of equivalence. And here it's the standard of equivalence that's important, right? So we, if we think of value in healthcare, we typically think of benefit over cost. The problem is we don't offer benefit without offering harm. That's the business that we're in. So it's really a net benefit minus harm over cost. And this is kind of the equation that's going through your head when you're making decisions about is this worthwhile or is this not. But then what's the standard of equivalence? How do we denominate these things? Cost is pretty easy. Cost you can denominate in dollars. Anyone got a suggestion for how to den denominate benefits over harm? I heard qualies somewhere out there. Qualies is the generally acceptable standard. This stands for quality adjusted life years. And kind of if you're looking at health services research, this is one of the ways that they depict benefits o benefit over harm. Has there, is there anyone in the room who has ever tried to discuss a decision with a patient using the term qualies? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't go well. And the reason why is because it's a cultural problem, right? We don't have a language or a culture that allows us to decide how much is a quality worth. We sort of have some general consensuses around if you're looking at large populations, you know, 50,000, 100,000, something like that. But when you're actually sitting across from a patient, this dialogue just doesn't work. So I would love to tell you all about qualies, and I will bring them up once as a tribute to qualies. But it's not super helpful at the bedside to know about quality adjusted life years because it doesn't help you in the conversation with the patient. So some principles I would like you to take home. The first, if there is no benefit, there is no value. So you can't have, if there's a zero in the numerator, it ain't going to be worth anything. Um, and a couple examples of that, antibiotics for a simple abscess or for an upper respiratory infection, we're not going to help. Easy to say that's not high value care. PPIs, courtesy of hospital, uh, Society of Hospital Medicine, no benefit, no value, just cost. And then the other thing is, if you have the same benefit, but a higher cost, there's less value. So my classic example of this are all of the enantiomeric drugs that don't add, it, don't add anything. You know? So we started, let's say, with levofloxacin. That's actually, that actually does something. 
that's different from ofloxacin. Then you kind of go down to, well, let's say escitalopram. Okay, maybe that's a little different. And then you get to levocetirazine, where basically you take a drug, cetirazine, that probably works, probably doesn't cause any side effects at all, and then you chop off the R, the R enantiomer that doesn't do anything, leave the L enantiomer, relabel it as Zizol, and start charging 100 bucks a month for a $1 drug. No added value. The time you should think most about the no added value thing is if you find yourself signing the line that says do not substitute, you gotta ask yourself what you're doing because that is rarely a high value line. The hard question that we all grapple with is what do we do with a little bit more benefit and a lot more cost? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Let's get it, let's, let's bust out your clickers. Those of you who have clickers, if you don't have clickers, there might be more in the back. If you do have clickers, please click them now. The question for you is which of the following had the highest US sales in dollars, not in, not in pills, but in dollars spent for, two, for 2013? And I apologize, we don't have 2014 data yet. The responses are coming in, that's good, that's good. It's always good when the clickers work. Wow, look at that, survey says, Oh, look at that, it's kind of an even, even split. So let's see, over here we have, uh, so the room is 18% rheumatologists voting for Humira, 17% uh, psychiatrists with Abilify, some Nexium folks, some uh, little Advair discus, and then oh, a lot of people like Prestor. Um, by the way, just, just for, for the record, I didn't say this in my disclosures, I generally don't use brand names in talks. I will be using brand names in this talk when we're actually talking about specific brands distributed by specific people. So these are not generic drugs, these are actual brand name drugs. So the answer, drum roll please, is actually Abilify. So Abilify, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is an atypical antipsychotic. It's got indications for both thought disorders and mood disorders, specifically depression. And it is leading the pack of all of these others uh, in US sales. So how did this happen? Why is it this drug? This is not a drug that a lot of us write for a lot. Well, there were two trials published in 2007 and 2008. These were not particularly large trials, 360, 380 patients. What they did is they took patients who, were, who got eight weeks of either SSRI or SNRI, like venlafaxine um, therapy, for depression and randomized them after not responding. They randomized them to either being on six weeks of aripiprazole, which is Abilify, versus placebo. What they found was a three-point improvement in the MADRS score, and for context, their baseline was 26, the so severe is 34, max is 60. So three points is a measurable improvement, not a massive improvement. And they found an improvement in the, re in the remission rate. Now this actually, I think this is clinically significant from the point of view of these are people who didn't respond to initial therapy. So a number needed to treat of 10 for people to feel better is actually not bad. They had, interestingly, fairly high rates of akathisia, not totally surprising for an antipsychotic, um, but not that many people stopped the drug. So this is the evidence. This is not evidence that would make me run out and write a ton of prescriptions. So I will submit more interesting information. And this is contingent upon me getting the audio system working. So let's see if this actually goes. Uh-oh, not looking good. Well, you can actually figure this out. I will narrate. <laughs> This is patient, this is her depression, it's very cute. And right now she is talking about how her depression used to get her down and her doctor treated her, here's her doctor, and her doctor treated her with antidepressants but they didn't really work. And then he told her about Abilify. And Abilify, when he told her that people could get better in one to two weeks with Abilify, then she kind of was able to stare down her depression. Now she is listening to her doctor, and I wish I could do this, like project myself on the wall, because now he is talking about all of the various possible side effects, which include things like tardive dyskinesia, and include things like, uh, I forget, I actually can't remember the entire laundry list. Oh yeah, please do not use Abilify if you have diabetes, blah, 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 blah. But you see her depression here is now relatively tame, and her family is happy, and your blood sugar should be monitored if you have her at risk of, if you have her at risk of diabetes. Um, much more friendly depression. So this is all good. Oh yeah, blood tests may be needed to monitor the, monitor the white blood cell count. So I apologize for the audio because you missed the characteristic of pharmaceutical ads, which is the very rapid litany of bad things that might happen to you. What, what is interesting about this ad is it's not clear anywhere in the ad, per, definitely for patients or even for a doctor, that this is not an antidepressant until they start talking about things like if you start having sudden movements that don't stop, please tell, please tell your doctor because that might never go away. <laughs> oh, I get it, it's an antipsychotic. So the answer to why Abilify 
largely has to do with a marketing blitz put on by the manufacturer of Abilify Atsuka. Um, and this is, here is the uh, uh, graph of atypical antipsychotic sales. This is Abilify. This 34% is actually Seroquel. And these are all of the others. Um, and by 2011, this, is, this is, was Abilify a chunk of the market share. And the sales just basically went up from there. So that's part of it. They marketed it very aggressively. They went to the FDA and got an indication for mood disorders, which are much more common than thought disorders or the type of thing you would usually use antipsychotics for. And they also marketed it in a niche that we most of us wouldn't use it in, which is the first add-on drug for a patient with major depression who doesn't respond. That was their niche. The other thing that they did, which is interesting, is this is the actual price of a bill. Of, this is the sales in dollars versus the number of prescriptions written. And what you're seeing is the number of prescriptions written is actually relatively flat. And this is about the past two years. This is quarter one of 2011 through 2013. And then starts to decline. But the sales go up. And why, did, why does this happen? Well, they just increased the price. So once you've got people on the drug and it's working, then you can kind of work your price up slowly, and it's tolerable. They also have this thing called a savings card, which basically what that does is that takes the patient copay and covers all but $25. So the manufacturer actually pays for all but $25 up to 150 bucks a month of the patient's copay. So the patients see $25. The manufacturer picks up another, you know, 100, 150, and then the rest of that cost all goes to the insurance company, and it's basically invisible. So this is probably the, very, the, the, the combination of things. So what do I want you to take home from this story? I want you to take home that marketing is very powerful. It power, has a powerful impact on patients. It has a powerful impact on us. You can't ignore that. You can't pretend that you are not affected by this stuff. So be aware of it. Think about it. Think about why you're making a decision whether or not it has to do with marketing. Things that are modestly helpful can certainly have extraordinary costs. There is very little correlation between what something costs and how good it is. Sometimes they match, sometimes they don't. And these coupons, you're going to see these a lot. These are definitely a mixed blessing because what they do is they lower cost for the patient, which is great, but they shift that cost elsewhere in the system, typically to an insurance company. So ultimately, the cost of the drug is still being paid for by somebody. Usually it's the patient's employer if they have one, otherwise it's usually the government. Um, but it's not the patient. So it's OK to use those coupons as a, as a way of advocating for patients, but it's far better to just prescribe a cheap drug in the first place. All right, another case. Ms. E, she's a 47-year-old woman who has chronic idiopathic urticaria. This is a high of basically covering half of her abdomen. Um, and the question is, she's starting omalizumab, which is a very expensive antibody to IgE, um, administered subcutaneously. And the thing that's particularly problematic about this drug is you need to administer it in a medical setting because for whatever reason, it might cause anaphylaxis. This is like the people who are allergic to prednisone. It's like it's an antibody to IgE unless you get anaphylaxis. Um, but you have to, so you have to give it at least in a doctor's office. And the question for you guys to think about, and let me get your, get your clickers primed here, is how much is this, what, where's the cheapest place for her to get this? So the question is, does, is it going to cost three times more if she gets it at a doctor's office, twice as much at a doctor's office, the same, twice as much at the hospital, three times more costly at the hospital? What do you guys think? <coughs> Survey says, oh, uh, yeah, 46% of you are cynical about hospital medicine. Well, you're also right. Um, it does cost more at the hospital, but it's not for the reason that you would think. You would think that right, out, that right now I'm about to go on a diatribe about facility fees. That's actually not what we're going to talk about. Let me show you what, how this breaks down. So this is what it would cost for her to get it. The, the administration fee is actually about the same, and this is, her, this is her deductible on $125 charge. So she pays $25 out of pocket to get the shot. Um, this is a black box, and I will explain why in a moment. But what we know is if she were to get it at a private office, her copay would be $200. At the hospital, we actually do have a, doc, a documented charge for her on the bill, which is $1,200. Her copay for that is 50%. So it costs her $625 to get it at the hospital, $225 to get it in a private office. Basically the same. Now, Zolaire also has one of those patient, one of the patient coupons, so she actually ended up paying less than this, but still a fair bit more than she would have paid here. So the question is why, and in order to explain why, I have to go on a digression about how, pharma, how pharmaceuticals are dispensed and funded in our country. So for those of you who fall asleep in the next five minutes, I apologize. <laughs> so let's start with a patient. Patient needs a drug. And then there's a manufacturer. Manufacturer has the drug the patient needs. So you would think that this would be the simplest answer to this. And actually, this is the way things were done in the 19th century. This is still the way things are done for over-the-counter medications. 
way too simple for our purposes. So let's introduce some other players. Here there's a pharmacy. The pharmacy's job is to collect the medications and safely give them to these patients and review our prescriptions. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, but, you know, basically distribute the drugs. And then there's an insurer whose job it is to pay for the drugs. Okay, now most of the players are on the board. Now we start figuring out how much this thing is going to cost. So the insurer gets on the line with the manufacturer and says, hey, you've got this great drug. I've got these beneficiaries. But, you know, it costs a little bit much. Can you give us a little bit of a break here? Sure, we'll give you a little bit of a break. And then the pharmacy gets on the line with the manufacturer. Hey, you've got this great drug. I've got all these outlets. I'd love to sell your drug, but you know it's a little bit expensive. Can you give us a little bit of a break on the wholesale price? Okay, they give us a little bit of a break. And then occasionally, the insurer also connects with the pharmacy. Say, hey, we've got all these beneficiaries. You've got all these outlets. Let's make a deal. They make a deal. So in between this triad, somehow they work out what the patient's going to pay for the drug, and the patient pays that to the pharmacy. This is the way things worked probably up until sometime in the early to mid-90s. The early to mid-90s saw the arrival of a new entity on the scene, and that was the pharmacy benefit manager. Um, how many of you are familiar with PBMs? Yeah, you're all familiar with PBMs because you've all signed faxes from these people. These are the people who send you the fax from Caremark or from Express Scripts or from whoever saying you need to fill out the following things. Or my personal favorite recently, you cannot prescribe generic pantoprazole for your patient. It has to be either omeprazole, Nexium, or Dexalant. So how does that happen? What happens is the PBM basically came in and moved all of these, and basically centralized all these relationships. So now the PBM negotiates with the insurer over reimbursement and how much their services are going to cost. They negotiate with the manufacturer over the cost of the drug, and they usually do this via rebates. So that instead of just discounting the drug, they get a rebate for each prescription that gets written. Um, and then they negotiate with the pharmacies saying, oh, wow, you're our preferred pharmacy. We're going to give you a better deal. How does the PBM make money? Sometimes they're paid by the insurer, but more often they're actually taking a cut of each of these discounts. So basically they cheat the other guy and pass the savings on to you. Um, it, PBMs are a mixed blessing, and we'll get to why in a second, but the thing that's important in this relationship is there aren't many PBMs. So these are large organizations representing huge volumes of patients, which gives them a tremendous amount of market power with the manufacturers. So they can get really deep discounts. Now, the PBMs sometime in the, in the 90s and thousands figured out that they actually didn't need to deal with the pharmacies at all. And so this is your mail order pharmacy. So when people are getting express script mail order, basically what they've done is just taken the retail pharmacy out of the picture and are working directly with the pharmacy benefits manager. Why are these a good thing? Well, there's no question that they're a big influence on drug pricing. And you're going to get the best deals from pharmacy benefit managers. And they get these huge volume discounts on brand name drugs. So, they are definitely a force that is holding down the cost of medication in the system because that is how they make their money. That's good. And patients actually often like their mail for order pharmacy. It's really convenient. You know, you do something online, drugs show up at your door, you don't have to talk to anybody, it's great. What are the problems? Well, if you're talking about generic drugs, then all of a sudden you've got this additional overhead that doesn't actually save much money because you don't have to play hardball with the manufacturer to get cheap generic drugs. And the classic example of this is the patient who has a $10 copay for a 30-day supply of a drug that would have cost four bucks cash at Walmart. That money is all going to the PBM. Actually, actually, more than that is going to the PBM because they probably paid a dollar for that drug. This is also the reason for these bizarre changing formularies. The reason why it had to be Nexium or Dexalant is because in 2015, they have contracts with the manufacturers of Nexium and Dexalant to get them a deal. They don't have a deal on generic pentobrazole. Um, and and it, the options for patients are limited, and that means both the limited formulary from the PBM but there also just aren't many PBMs. So it's sort of like, you don't, there's not a lot of control for anyone in this system, either patients or insurers. So how did this play out for this patient? It turns out that her pharmacy benefit manager actually had negotiated discounts with specialty pharmacies, specific specialty pharmacies that could dispense the drug to a private doctor's office for their in-network copay, which was a flat copay of 200 bucks. But the hospital pharmacy is out of network. And the hospital pharmacy, because it's a hospital, basically has a monopoly on that hospital. You can't use any other pharmacy there. So she had to pay $600 in order to get the drug from the hospital's pharmacy. <laughs> Why do I bring up this whole story for you? Well, two things. One is about pharmacy benefits managers in general, that, steep, that there's these steep discounts for, for expensive drugs. And if the drug is both on the formulary and the pharmacies in network, it can save the patient a lot of money. But they may not be the best, but they may not be the best option for cheap generics. Um, those, that may be a time when you actually say, maybe you should look at Target, maybe you should look at Walmart, maybe you can get this cheaper for cash. But the other thing that I think we need to keep in mind is these constant formulary changes that drive us crazy, these are not deliberately intended to annoy us. These are the direct byproduct of allowing the market to work in this way. 
So if we don't like that, then we have to work in ways that are going to change the market. And one way that you can change the market is to prescribe fewer expensive drugs so that there's less need for all of this renegotiating. But this is not, this is not madness. This is actually logical. All right, enough about that. Let's go back to something a little bit more clinical. 64-year-old woman with hypertension on hydrochlorothiazide, 25 milligrams. And she comes in with acute left first MTP pain, AKA podagra. You successfully tap her toe. Yes. And, and you get uric acid crystals out. Um, she's allergic to non-steroidal, so you give her some prednisone. She gets better. Her serum uric acid is 9.2. She has gout. Is that, that's not clear she has gout. That is not the question. <laughs> the question is, what are you going to do with her gout? So your options are, you can put her on some allopurinol. You can put her on some colchicine and then put her on allopurinol. You can put her on colchicine probenicid or cobenamid, then allopurinol. You can put her on febuxostat, which I put in there just so I could say that. And, or you could change your hydrochlorothiazide to losartan. Please vote. They all vote fast. All right, 52% of you got my trick question on changing hydrochlorothiazide to losartan. Thank you very much. You make me feel smart. Yeah, so talking briefly about antihypertensives and gout, um, loop and thiazide diuretics both impair urate excretion. We probably overstate that effect because it actually really starts to spike above 50 of thiazide. So we don't often use 50 of thiazide unless you're putting someone on 25 of chlorthalidone, which is the same. Um, so typically, the doses we use is probably not that big a deal. If they're also on an ACE, it actually blunts that um, urate retention effect. Interestingly, losartan actually has a uric uric effect that is unique in ARBs. So it is a particularly good drug for people, for people with gout. But if you need to have them on a diuretic, you can have them on a diuretic as long as you're controlling their uric acid with something that works. So that was very clever, but it didn't actually work. Um, her uric acid level does come down a bit, but she has another flare. It's, only, it's still 8.4. So the question is, what do you guys want to do now? So now you go back to ABCD, start allopurinol, start colchicine, then allopurinol, start, start colchicine probenicid, then allopurinol, start prolexistat. Thank you for all the clever people who stopped her, her, her hydrochlorothiazide. All right, survey says, so we have a split between let's start allopurinol versus let's start colchicine plus allopurinol. If you want to do this, nobody likes febuxostat. But it's, it's such a cool name. So, First question is, is it worth doing colchicine? Now, this is one of these things that ha I had filed in my brain under lore that, that colchicine prevents gout flares. It turns out it's actually been studied. Um, now, what's interesting is this was not a huge study. This was 44 patients who were randomized to colchicine uh, twice daily versus placebo. They were, what they did is they did it while they were adjusting allopurinol. Once they're on a stable dose of allopurinol, they actually continued it for three months later. Um, but even with 44 people, you're seeing p-values in the thousands because it makes a big difference. Half of a flare versus, the, versus three flares on average, and this is a 10-point pain scale. So this is probably something that's worth doing. Now, if you weren't allergic to NSAIDs, you could potentially do the same thing with NSAIDs, but it is probably worth doing something to suppress flares while you're titrating hyperuricemic therapy, and colchicine works well. Question is, what's, why isn't colchicine cheap? Many of us do remember when colchicine was cheaper than dirt. Now all that you can get is colchris. Colchris is expensive, and some of you probably recognize that, which is why you shifted to let's just start the allopurinol. What happened with colchicine is it actually was used for gout with no FDA approval. It was off-label for, for decades, long, long time. And then in 2009, Takeda Pharmaceuticals noticed that there was no FDA label for this, and they applied for one, and they got it. They got 17 patents on it. I have no idea how you get 17 patents on colchicine for gout, but they did it. These are uric acid crystals, for those of you who have never met them. And so the net effect is that colchicine is really expensive because it's brand name only. What's interesting is colchicine probenicid is not brand name only. So if you wanted to give this person colchicine and you wanted to spend less than $200 a month, you could actually give them generic cobenamid for 30 to 60 bucks a month. Why am, I why am I telling you this? So a couple of, the main reason why I'm telling you this is because this is like something arcane about the generic drug market. There's no way to know unless you know it. So now I'm telling you. More importantly, when you know these things, please share them. These things don't get out. There's no one with an interest in you knowing this. There's no one making money off of this. So share them with each other. So take home points from this. I'd say the first thing is before you start something new, ask if there's something that you can stop or change that might solve the problem. If, you're, if you have a patient with gout, pull out the losartan. It's fine. Um, but the main thing is that the generic drug market is full of these kind of weird quirks. And you should be open to these kind of creative solutions. Um, and I'm sure there's got to be a rheumatologist in here somewhere who can call me out on this later. But I think it's actually okay to use the, use colchicine probenicid. 
Okay, now next up, the dreaded question on testosterone because you can't do grand rounds at the U without bringing up testosterone somehow. So, 72-year-old guy with erectile dysfunction has a good response to sildenafil, sees his naturopath, his naturopath sends, to, sends him to the lab, actually gets too low testosterone, doing what you're supposed to do, early morning, 200, 295, 275, so low, not super low, but low. And the, and the naturopath said, you should be on bioidentical testosterone, whatever that is. He comes in asking for your opinion, normal libido, normal physical exam, normal testes, and he wants to, and the question is, what do you want to do next? So A, don't do that bioidentical stuff, let me give you the real deal. B, I don't want to give you testosterone, but sure, you could try the bioidentical stuff. C, let's recheck your testosterone. I don't know, trust that naturopath's lab. Or D, just don't go there. Survey says, just don't go there. A few of you wanted to recheck testosterone. Great, and I'm here to tell you that that is, a, that is an evidence-based response. So this is an interesting study that I hadn't seen before, got published in Annals. Fairly small, 140 men with low testosterone. And basically what they did was they all got sildenafil for erectile dysfunction. That was their presenting complaint. And then they randomized them to either get testosterone gel versus placebo. And then they followed them. And what you're seeing up here, this is an erectile function score. This is a quality of life score. Solid line is actually placebo. Dashed line is testosterone. None of these differences are significant other than the difference in erectile function with sildenafil. That was a big jump. But then adding testosterone to sildenafil made absolutely no difference. Same here, you're actually seeing non-significantly lower quality of life scores in the men on testosterone. So testosterone probably doesn't add much to PDE5 inhibitors for erectile dysfunction. So what does it do? <laughs> well, it clearly increases grip strength, it clearly increases muscle mass, it clearly increases bone mineral density, and it has a positive effect on libido. If that's what you're going for, it's worth considering testosterone supplementation in men who are truly hypogonadal. The things you have to keep in mind, it also does cause real polycythemia. You actually do need to follow hematocrits. I don't know how many of you were at the uh, regional ACP meeting in November. There was actually a case presented of a guy who had a stroke that they thought was attributable to polycythemia from testosterone. It also brings your BPH back to baseline risk. It doesn't probably make it any worse, but if your BPH was relieved by your lack of testosterone, you put it back, that comes back. Open questions, a lot of debate over what it does to prostate cancer risk. Um, some debate over fracture risk, although there's basically just limited data. And cardiovascular disease is also one of these things where the jury keeps going in and out. Um, all right, let's keep going with him. He, he, he likes the idea of no testosterone. He wasn't thrilled with doing that anyway. So, but he's, having con he's concerned because he's taking 50 milligrams of sildenafil, and that just costs too much for him. So what do you want to do with him? One, would be, one option would be you could give him a prescription for 100 milligrams of sildenafil. This is Viagra, by the way. I think everybody knows that. Um, and then tell him to cut it in half, see if that saves him money. One would be to switch the prescription down to 20 milligrams and, this, and give him two tablets. One would be to switch to Tadalafil or Cialis and use a half tablet of that because it lasts longer. Maybe he'll use less. Or you could switch to 2.5 milligrams of Cialis daily. Um, or you could give him the, you could administer the IPSS questionnaire hoping that he has lower urinary tract symptoms from BPH. What do you guys want to do? Push your buttons. Survey says, okay, so most of you want to have him take half a tablet of uh, Viagra, which is, re which is reasonable. Um, and miscellaneous others. I'm surprised not more of you wanted to give him BPH. Um, because this is actually, now that the FDA has an indication for Tadalafil for BPH, this is kind of the end run towards getting people Tadalafil, although it's still going to be really expensive. But let's look at the actual pricing. So sildenafil, brand name Viagra, costs about $30 a pill regardless of strength. So for those of you who were telling him to cut a $100 milligram pill in half, you actually did save him about half the money he was spending, down to $16 to $18. However, sildenafil 40 milligrams is much less expensive than this, and we'll get to why that is in a second. Tadalafil, kind of the same ballpark. Uh, 10 milligrams, this is, the, this is the daily Cialis daily dose, which is why this is cheaper. So if you really did want to give him 10 milligrams, it's actually cheaper to give him two 5 milligram tablets than half of a 20. And if you wanted to put him on true daily Cialis, that costs 100 bucks a month. So what is this about? Why is it cheaper to give two 20s rather than half of 100? So this has to do with the arcane nature of our system. 
Sildenafil, it turns out, the original patent on Sildenafil was in 1992, and it was to treat cardiovascular diseases. I don't know how many of you remember this anecdote, but they thought they had an antihypertensive on their hands, and then when the study was over and it didn't work for blood pressure, all of the placebo pills came back, but very few of the non-placebo pills, the active drug, came back, <laughs> particularly from male patients. And then it's like, huh, maybe we've got something here. Um, so they patented it again using what's called a method of use patent to treat erectile dysfunction in 2002. That patent doesn't expire until 2020. But the patent for the use of cardiovascular diseases has already expired. And it turns out there is a brand of sildenafil used for cardiovascular diseases. It's Rivashio, which is used to treat pulmonary hypertension, a dose of 20 milligrams TID. What this means is if you write a prescription for, a 20, milligram, for 20 milligrams of sildenafil, they can do a generic substitution. If you write for 50 or 100, they can't. And I see Barack Gaster sitting in the audience. This is one of these things that I didn't hear until Barack told me about it. So again, trip tips to share with one another. Take home points about sildenafil. I would not check testosterone routinely in patients with erectile dysfunction. It's kind of like checking thyroid in patients with weight gain. You know, it's like maybe occasionally it's there, but generally it's not. Um, and if all that you're treating is erectile dysfunction, just treat that. Generic sildenafil isn't cheap by any standard, but it's definitely a lot cheaper if you use that 20 milligram dose. And tadalafil may be covered for BPH, but it's a real pain and they're still gonna pay a lot for it. But if, if you feel like you need to go that route, that is, a, that is an option. Okay, another question. So this is a 77 year old woman with hypertension and diabetes. She develops new onset atrial fibrillation. She has good rate control diltiazem and she does not wanna be cardioverted. I do not like electricity, doctor, thank you very much. Um, and the question is, what's the highest value option to anticoagulate her? And would it be giving her an aspirin? Would it be treating her with warfarin adjusted to an INR of two to three, giving her a pixaban, or it's complicated? <laughs> All right, let's see. Survey says, it's complicated. A lot, of you thought, a lot of you liked warfarin too, but the majority of you said it's complicated. That is the correct answer in this case. I will explain why it's complicated. For the 14% of you who, who chose aspirin, if there, are any, if there are any students in this room doing their internal medicine clerkship, you should know that she had a CHADS 2 score of three. Please do not use aspirin. All right, so let's see, what would this actually cost? Aspirin, cheaper than dirt. Warfarin, the drug itself is super cheap. We'll get back to that in a second. Apixaban, rivaroxaban, dabigatran, three new oral, new oral anticoagulants, not surprisingly, all priced to compete with one another at the generally three to $400 a month. But if you look at the total costs of anticoagulation, so now you're not looking at how much the pills cost, you're looking at how much the INRs cost, how much the doctor visits cost, and how much the increased bleeding with warfarin costs. There was actually a study done on this in 2009, and they found that apixaban actually added a little bit of quality of life at a modest cost. Now, there were problems with this study. The two biggest ones is they assumed that people were getting their INR tested weekly, which is probably a little bit often for someone who's on a stable dose of warfarin. And they assumed that we would be paying the same price for, for a Pixaban that they do in Europe. <laughs> um, we actually pay considerably more than this. So it's still probably not completely cost effective. But the reason why it's complicated is if you look at the total costs of healthcare, new oral anticoagulants are actually not as expensive as you might think because they save a ton of costs. The problem with looking at it in the United States is most of our costs are actually divided between two insurance plans. Most of us have insurance coverage for drugs and have insurance coverage for medical procedures. And what you're doing, for example, with Medicare is if you put someone on a new oral anticoagulant, you're shifting costs basically from their Part B plan to their Part D plan, and the plans are not happy about this. Part B plan's probably fine with it. Part D plan, not so much. Um, so you're, it's not surprising that you're seeing quicker adoption at systems where they have actually paying for everything. The VA looked at this and they put dabigatran on the formulary fairly quickly. Um, but the best option for each individual patient is really gonna vary on what are their co-pays for their various insurance and what are their convenience factors and all that stuff. Um, so this one actually really is complicated. Um, for now, it's probably still for most patients gonna be cheaper to use warfarin, but it depends on each on the patient and their coverage. Stick with anticoagulation for one more question. So this is a 74-year-old woman, uh, her sister, she's taken warfarin continuously since she had a mechanical AVR eight years ago. She now has symptomatic sinus bradycardia and they wanna put a pacer in her. And, the and she's asking, so what should they do with her anticoagulation? So you can A, continue warfarin with a target INR of two and a half to three and a half. B, stop warfarin and give her low molecular weight heparin for bridging. C, stop warfarin and give her IV heparin for bridging. D, let the cardiologist decide. <laughs> All right, 
14% of you believe in real politic. 54% of you said, let's bridge her with low molecular weight heparin. So I'm going to show you the results of a single study. And the reason why I included this study is probably because it's interesting, but also because cardiology studies all have cool acronyms, but this is the best ever. <laughs> so this was a randomized control trial done in Canada. And they did it 680, 681 patients who had a substantial annual risk of stroke. About 30% of these folks had mechanical valves as their indication for anticoagulation. And they were getting pacemakers placed. And they basically randomized them to either continuing their warfarin through the procedure or switching over to low molecular weight heparin, largely. Twenty few people got IV heparin for bridging, which is kind of what we would conventionally do. What they found is the biggest difference is that basically three times as many people bled with heparin as bled with warfarin. The number needed to treat to prevent one pocket hematoma was eight. There was no difference in any other outcome, strokes, anything else, other than patient satisfaction, which no surprise was higher with warfarin. Um, so it's interesting if you look at the paper why they explain this. They said, well, maybe if, if they're still on warfarin and there's more bleeding, there's more attention to hemostasis during the procedure. I don't know. I don't put these things in. But I think it's worth, uh, the reason I think this study is important is it's worth asking the question for virtually every invasive procedure. Do we need to bridge people with heparin? Is that really the best answer? And I'm hoping that those studies are going to go on. Um, what can I t give you take home points about anticoagulation? It's hard to figure out a global answer to the question of neural anticoagulants. It's going to be individualized for each patient based on, on what, they are, what they can afford and what's covered. Um, but I think we should also question these plans for low molecular weight heparin bridging. At least, at least raise your hand and say, have you heard of this bruise control thing? OK, so I need to wrap up because I have to leave time for questions. I was told strictly that that's part of it. But I don't want to leave you without my pharma manure list. <laughs> And these are a list of drugs that make me particularly grumpy. I told you there would be a rant. This is where the rant comes in. I thought I would share these with you. This is not about, hopefully none of you are going to prescribe these. Hopefully you're not going to learn anything about high value prescribing other than what's out there and why we shouldn't do this. Uh, this is going to be a countdown top five list. So number five, Vitas. This is a relatively new product. It is a cough syrup made of chlorpheniramine and hydrocodone. So it used to be you would combine codeine, which has some toxicities with guaifenesin that basically doesn't do anything. Now they've taken out the guaifenesin and they put in chlorpheniramine, which is a fairly potent H1 blocker, which will make you double sleepy and double crazy. All this for a mere $150 a bottle. <laughs> Brisdel, this is a new labeling of paroxetine to treat hot flashes, which basically you split the difference between 10 milligrams of paroxetine, which is dirt cheap, and 5 milligrams of paroxetine, which is dirt cheap, and you get $145 a month. Luzu. Luzu is a new topical imidazole. Who knew we knew needed more topical imidazoles? The, the selling point with Luzu is that you can treat jock itch in only one week. They don't mention that, the, that only one in five people actually gets better. $400, please. And then one of my personal favorites is something called Promiseb. And this is a real thing. You can really prescribe it. And it's, it's indicated for seborrheic dermatitis. And it's an emollient cream with nothing in it. <laughs> and if there's anyone who can find the active ingredient in Promiseb, please come tell me, because I would love to take this off. Um, I, I, I found out recently, I went back before the talk, and now they also sell Promiseb Complete, which includes shampoo. <laughs> 113 bucks. Um, but the number one drug that makes me grumpy, um, and as promised, I'm going to give you the antibody here at the end, uh, is a drug called Lucentis. And what Lucentis is, is it's a, it's a vastin that's basically been tweaked and repackaged for wet macular degeneration at a 4,000% markup. So let me, let me show you how this works. So this is a vastin. Um, a vastin is bevacizumab, and it is a monoclonal antibody that's been humanized, and it's made against vascular endothelial growth factor. And we use it for treating cancer because it goes and inhibits vascular endothelial growth factor. There's less neovascularization. It actually works. It costs about 600 bucks for a 100 milligram vial. Well, someone thought, well, gosh, you know, Neovascularization plays a process, plays a role in wet macular degeneration. Maybe if you invest, injected this same thing into people's eyes with wet macular degeneration, it would actually help. And it turns out they were right. It does help with wet macular degeneration. And if, if you were to take this drug at $600 a vial and kind of dilute it and mix it in a way that you could safely inject it into people's eyeballs, it would cost about $50 a dose for that. So the manufacturer saw this, saw that they did not have an FDA indication for treatment of macular degeneration and figured they had to fix that. So how they fixed it is they made a new drug. So these here are the antibody binding fragments of Avastin, with the rest of the whole FC portion goes away. 
Um, and this is ranibizumab. It is basically the same drug. They just took away a big unnecessary portion. This, they've got FDA approved for wet macular degeneration. This costs $2,000 per dose. Um, and this is actually prescribed mostly by ophthalmologists, it's no surprise. And depending on the arrangement, the ophthalmologist can sometimes get a little bit of this. Um, it, it, they also have, even if they don't have a financial incentive, they have the additional incentive of if somebody sues you, it is generally better to be using the FDA approved drug than to be using the drug that's off label and done by a compounding pharmacy. So there are a lot of drivers behind why Medicare is spending so much money on this particular drug, but this is one where I just can't forgive the drug company. This is basically just sheer profiteering. So some closing points that I want you to go home with in terms of how to, how to be a high value prescriber. And this is, if you only remember five things, it's this. Is get the data, share your tricks, thank you Barack, resist the hype, and ask your patient. And for those of you who are motivated, I would say take a stand. So what do I mean by this? So the only reliable resource for comparative e efficacy is good evidence. So we need to both advocate for, continue, for ongoing production of evidence and look at things that, things that review, at reviews. Um, the thing that I want you to remember is that the most evidence is usually going to be for generics. If you look at the whole body of literature, it's going to be the drugs that have been around a long time, which are typically generic drugs. But the newest is always going to be for brand names, because those are the people who are funding the studies. Um, so if what, you're re if what you're interested in is the newest, hottest paper, it's generally going to be involve a brand name drug. But if you look at the whole body of evidence, it's mostly going to be for generic drugs. Systematic reviews are very helpful. Cochrane reviews are awesome. The VA Pharmacy Benefits Manager wing, they actually have a blog where they review drugs. They're great. They're basically totally unbiased. Um, aggregators like Dynamed and UpToDate and Medical Letter, they're also really helpful. They give you pretty good information. I often find when I'm looking at these, I tend to want to go to the links more. Kind of be like, hmm, what's that about? What's that about? So you often need to go down to the references and look at those with these. But, this, but definitely know, what, know the data for what you're prescribing. That really helps. Share your tricks. It is amazingly difficult to get new information on generic drugs. There is basically no money interest in doing that. And it surprises me, but it, nobody promotes them. Things like splitting pills, things like dual indications, um, things like knowing about generic sildenafil. These are all things that you can share with each other that are like, you know, and it makes you look smart, right? It makes you look clever. Um, you can also use tools like, for example, GoodRx, which is a website and, a, and an app. That will tell you what things cost at most of the nearby chain pharmacies. So if you want to know what something costs, you can look it up. It's not that hard. Resisting the hype. So if patients are asking for a drug by name, find out what they know about it. You know, and the good chance their source was, the source of their information was either, was either mainstream media, which is variable in quality, or advertising. Um, be very cautious with industry-sponsored studies, but you can't discount them because that is where most of the studies are being sponsored. So you can't just throw out industry-sponsored studies, but you should recognize that at least the funder and potentially the investigator had an interest in that being a successful study. I would say beware of industry-provided information. So this can be either the advertisement that you see in the, in the New England Journal. This can be the rep that hands you something. That's always going to be selected for your benefit. And don't be afraid to look things up in real time. I can honestly say I'm a generalist. I sit in the room with a computer a lot. I look things up a lot because I don't know the answer. I have never once had a patient say, oh, I'm disappointed that you're looking this up. They, generally speaking, seem fairly happy that I'm willing to look things up when I don't know the answer. And the other thing is to remember that some drugs actually are that good. You notice I did not anywhere mention Lodiposphere sofosbuvir. We can talk a whole lot about Harvoni, which is the new drug for hepatitis C, and whether or not Gilead is price gouging, blah, blah, blah. But that drug is amazing. So there are some drugs that, man, it's probably cost effective. So there are some drugs that actually are worth what we pay for them. That's not the low-hanging fruit here. The low-hanging fruit is the stuff that we're paying too much for. Involving the patients is always a good idea. Um, so, and this is both the, here's what I think this is going to cost you. Is it worth that much to you? But also, knowing their formulary, um, actually, Electronic medical records are more helpful with this. Epic is rapidly learning formularies. That's very helpful. How much are they willing to spend is often a good question. And interestingly, this is the United States of America. There actually do seem to be some patients who really think they're getting better drugs if they're paying the full price. So it's like it's actually important to them that those be expensive. If that's a thing, I need to know that that's a thing. And then for the few of you who are actually, who are actually interested in it, there is a, lots of opportunities to take a stand and to get involved here. You know, the system has very obvious flaws, very obvious weird incentives. Um, there's lots of opportunities to advocate for change. Even locally, you know, your local pharmacy and therapeutics committee often value clinician input. You can do QI projects around reducing use of, of overused or overpriced drugs. Um, 
opportunities to speak with the state legislature. I first thought I might have actually seen Dan Wessler, but you know, you can certainly email Dan. And you know, honestly, I don't know if Congress is going to do anything this term. They didn't really do anything last term. But for things on the national level, like whether or not the FDA should be funded by the drug companies, that's really a congressional issue. Lots of opportunities for advocacy here. That is all that I have to say. Um, I would be delighted to entertain questions. I will, the chief residents are going to walk around with microphones, so please don't just shout at me. If you want to send me something on Twitter, if you're at a faraway place, I can always check my Twitter feed and see what's going on there, but I'm not holding my breath on that either. <laughs> Yes, sir. CDC is very positive on Relenza and Amantadine these days. Could you compare that with Tylenol or acetaminophen for flu? Could I compare Relenza and Amantadine with Tylenol and acetaminophen, and acetaminophen for flu? Um, interesting. I, well, the data I actually know, know best are for Oseltamivir, which is Tamiflu, so I can't speak specifically to Relenza. Um, but the data that I'm familiar with is that it basically shortens the duration of flu by about a day and a half. Um, I, I'm not as familiar with data, and I'm you know, probably several ID docs in the audience as to whether or not there's evidence to support its use in, high, in our highest risk patients, but I would advocate for that. Um, Tylenol and acetaminophen helps you feel better, um, but it's not going to actually change the course of the disease. Tamiflu and treatment of flu with antivirals is obviously a big deal this year because there's a mismatch between the vaccine and the circulating strains. Um, I don't think it's wrong to treat people who are at highest risk of complications with, neuram with neuraminidase inhibitors for flu. Um, I'm not sure it adds a ton of value in patients who are otherwise healthy. Other questions? Oh, it, okay. So I wanted to thank you for bringing up the example of colchicine because as residents, I think we're quite confused about it. We all know it's expensive. And last week when we were on cardiology, actually, there was a, a debate amongst our threes because we had a patient who was in a gout flare and he was on colchicine. And the question was, how long should he be on it? And actually, what we found is that the ACR recommends a year of colchicine following a gout flare. And actually, we were all very surprised. Um, and I guess I would question with the information you've given us, it doesn't seem like that's A, common practice or B, cost effective. I am surprised by that too. Are there any rheumatologists in the room who care to comment? Going once, going twice. That is not the data. That I would say that's not really supported by the data. If you, and that's assuming that you can get them on adequate antihyperuricemic therapy, which is a substantial assumption. But it looked to me, based on the one very small study, that if you can get their uric acid down, three months later, you can probably stop the colchicine. I was worried this was going to be a pericarditis question. I think that's much trickier, because there, there is benefit with long-term therapy. And there's not, I wouldn't put those people on cobenamid forever. Whew. Anyone else have any other questions I can't answer? <laughs> Earl. Great, great talk, Chris. Um, in the world of diabetes right now, the fastest growing drug are these, this new class of SGLT2 inhibitors. They are just skyrocketing. And the reason is, is because patients get coupons which give them free drug for an entire year. Free drug. And if you go and look at GoodRx.com, it's, it's about 10 bucks a pill. Um, so my question is, what happens at the end of the year after the patients are done getting their free drug? What, what, what's going to happen? That depends on how many yeast infections they've had in the meantime. Because um, that's the major, I think that's the dose limiting toxicity of SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, it depends, you know, maybe the drug company re-ups them, maybe they don't. It, I think if you look at, mo I'm not familiar with those specific coupons, but I'm guessing it's the same thing. As the drug company will eat your copay, and then the actual cost of the drug goes to the insurance company. So if that's the case, then the drug company can basically continue to do that indefinitely. And as long as someone is paying for 80% of the cost of the medication, they're going to make money. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure your opinion on SGLT2 inhibitors. They don't seem like the holy grail to me. So I'm a little surprised that they're going ballistic. This, this question I was going to be worried about, why is the cost of insulin doubled in the past several years? And I don't know that either. <laughs>